Hi, I'm Nancy Gardner. Glad you could join me. You know, Warren Buffett, he has a way of saying things that is superior to any of the rest of us. And what he says about value is worth repeating. Price is what you pay. Value is what you get. And what that means is it's what they think of, in, this, in our case, what we did for them. That's how they're going to define value. And so we want to look much more closely at that. And there is a lot of noise today about providing value, you know, understanding it, knowing it, communicating it. And it's really important. What is your value proposition? If you don't know, neither will anyone else. And our, our competition increases both online and off. Knowing your value is important because it is important to the people who hire you. Factor in industry projections that we will see a rise in full-service discount brokerages. That will be their model. It's not because they've got a bunch of crummy agents that don't know how to do their job. It's because this is how their model is set up. Think Redfin, for example. You know, well, you know, now that un helps you understand the picture that you're going to be facing and why your value platform is so essential. So to understand what the new consumer values, first thing we want to do is start with the new consumer. According to a study done by Harvard Business Review, there is a consumer crisis of trust, both in government and in business. This lack of trust exists worldwide and to a higher degree in this country. We've got ample evidence of that. All you got to do is watch the news. But who are they? Well, according to these same research people, the new consumer is mistrustful, the new consumer is skeptical, and the new consumer is very, very well informed. If you take away nothing from our discussion today, take this next sentence and put it, I don't, tattoo it on your forehead. It's about them, not us. It's about them, not us. That's what we have to understand. That's what we have to deal with. This is what we have to plan around. And so what's all this got to do with the practice of buying and selling real estate? Well, we've long been a relationship business. And due to these changes in the consumer, those of us in this industry will no longer be able to thrive and prosper on that relationship basis alone. In other words, the relationship won't stand alone as a way to create business. Now, it's based on a combination of our having a relevant, consistent relationship with our sphere and verifiable skills. Your sphere of influence wants to see your results in both your production and in your reviews. Both matter a lot. The new consumer expects data. This is what they value, simplified, understandable from their perspective. What does that mean? They want to know data in terms of how that cur the current market data, which reflect current market conditions, affect their ability to buy and affect their ability to sell. Okay, and what you want to understand is they want you to be specific. This is a shift from our general generalized opinions of the past. It helps to remember that they no longer blindly trust. Most of them lost a lot in the Great Recession, and they haven't forgotten it. So think numbers first. Again, value. Think numbers first. Use them at every opportunity to make a point or to back up your advice and your counsel. And please don't take their expectations personally. This exists everywhere. Every kind of business is experiencing this. Think about how you go about major purchases today. Most of us do more research, and we ask a lot more questions than we used to. If you understand this and you prepare for it, your responses will reflect an understanding of them and empathy of where they're coming from. Again, that has value to them. So, for example... 
when somebody asks us how the real estate market is, and I don't know how you go anywhere and not get asked that question, instead of responding with that crazy self-serving response, oh, it's a great time to buy and sell. How about changing it to this, for example? In Fairfax County, closed sales are up 10% year over year, and our average sales price has increased an average of 5% in the past year. The real issue we're facing in our market is low listing inventory, which is down about 12% year over year. That's a response that they'll listen to. That's a response that tells them you're on the ball. You know what's going on in your market. If you want people to listen to you and see you as a professional, use the numbers. Another approach might be in your marketing. You know how every year you always, I know I get five or six of them at one time. I got a ton of them last fall. People offering CMAs, you know, and the cards would come in. I'm low on listings. I need listings. What do I care? What do I care that you're low on listings? Truth is, I don't. You're making it about you. How about flipping that and making it about them? Okay? So... Instead of an I need listings approach, change the message to, for example, since 2012, the real estate market in Fairfax County has appreciated an average of 28%. If you've considered selling, now may be the time to explore your options. For a market analysis with no obligation, contact me at. You see the service? Do you see now you're giving them a frame of reference? I mean, most people know that markets have come back since the bottom of the recession, which in Fairfax County was 2012, but they may not know how much. Give them a perspective. It isn't, you know, appreciated an average of, an average, blah, 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 blah. That gives them something to go from. And so if they have been thinking about selling, they've got a better point of reference. Those are the kinds of changes we need to be thinking about. Next point of value, your sphere of influence. I know you guys have heard me talk about this a lot, but I, I'm going to say to you again and again, this is essential today. It is absolutely essential. You know, before all the crazy ways we have to communicate, which we have today, I used to tell all of you that if you were working your sphere of influence monthly and you were effective at how you were connecting, you could expect 70% of your business from your sphere. Today, that number has grown to 85%. So what I'm asking you is 85% of your business coming from your sphere. That tells you you are effective in building a relationship with them. So that 85% is only going to materialize if you can demonstrate a consistent monthly, think monthly, relevant relationship with them. Now, this is different from an email list, all right? Don't confuse the two. I know a lot of trainers lump those together. That's baloney. Sphere of influence is made up of people you know and that know you. The word relationship is overused. It implies a connection on some level and regular contact. So, for example, emailing local, local market data, keep it, keeping it simple, is a great way to go about this. And it's what they want, so they value it. I've got agents that have branded themselves to their sphere because they send monthly market data out by email. And they've been doing it for a couple of years now. So there's the word again, value. Create your CRM. Be sure to personalize that email with, with a greeting. Even though you've got your sphere lumped into a group, that's okay. And that group gets that email data once a month. They can all get the same greeting sentence which says I cannot believe how cold it is once I thaw out I hope to see you out and about something that says you are hands on you had a hand in sending them this you know don't buy some service that a hundred of other agents in your market are using 
Remember, spheres of influence overlap. Everybody's got five or six agents in their sphere or they don't have any friends. What happens when they get the same thing from more than one agent, it actually diminishes your connection with them. And especially if it looks like some service that you just purchased and you had no hand in, in, in developing the, the data and sending it to them. Now, I've given you two handouts. You can download them. One is the monthly market data form for 2018. Use it as a business person. This, every bit of this information is necessary from tracking your market in simple terms to keeping track of how your own business is comparing to market activity also understanding where your business is coming from. That's how you track how much business is coming from your sphere. If you did 10 deals last month and eight of them came from your sphere, that's 80%. And lastly, generationally, who are your customers? It's becoming more and more important. I've taught all of you about generational differences years ago. And because the millennial that younger buyer is really now coming, really coming in to our markets. They weren't for a while, but in the last year or so, depending on your job market, obviously, they're now active buyers. You want to make sure that you understand that and you're adapting to the approaches that they value. Now, has to be said, phone call is the game changer in your sphere of influence connection. Everybody can mail, everybody can email, and most do. But again, it's your willingness to personalize, again, part of having a relationship that'll get you noticed above everybody else. Now, how do we do this? This is so easy now. I used to call it email etiquette. And what I meant was is that we're going to follow up our first connection with them via email with the monthly market data, for example, with a phone call and we were going to ask permission to consent, continue sending that data monthly. Well, Seth Godin wrote a book on it called Permission Marketing. He is smarter than I am and I will defer to him any time of the day. It's called Permission Marketing. And so that's where you'll actually ask permission to continue sending that email that you started sending this month with the market data. I have yet to have an agent tell me that somebody didn't want it. But if that happens, you just say, thank you for letting me know. You know, I will remove your name from the list immediately. Hope to see you out and about and on Facebook. Whatever. Don't take it personally. Just do what they ask you to do. You And, and, and when you're doing that monthly email data, it really does free you up to be social. And so, once you do that permission marketing phone call, and you only talk to them once a quarter, this is not like you're calling them every other week, the next quarter, you can be social. You can ask about an event that you might be going to to see if they're going. You might respond to a Facebook post they've made. And you should, you know, also have that social contact with them. They really appreciate it. It strengthens the relationship. Now, this is important in all this. No selling, no asking. They get plenty of both, and they hate that people are always asking and not providing. Instead, provide the data and information they value, do it consistently, and you'll be the first person they think of when they come across someone wanting a referral. You have become their real estate go-to person by providing the data they want. That's value, people. The next piece of value is in your online profile. This is really, really important today. Everybody's online, and they're going online first. There's a lot of info out there, and it's increasing, I mean, every day. Now, this is what's significant about why your profile needs to be addressed a certain way. 94% of buyers and sellers did research online 
before contacting any of us. And we know this because we track it. Well, a little over a year ago, we were able to get another piece of information, which was it really surprised a lot of people. And what that ex ex extra information said to us was, look, of that 94% that are looking online, 70% of those people are looking at agents they know. They're not out there searching for an agent. They're looking at you guys because they've always preferred to work with somebody they know. And what are they looking at? They're looking at your profile. So how do you stand out? First, what you want to understand is that according to a study done earlier, early last year by Microsoft, you've got eight seconds to grab their attention. That's our average attention span online. Now, for a little perspective on that, compare that with the goldfish. They have an attention span of nine seconds. So what are they looking for? If we've got eight seconds, what's going to grab their interest? They are looking for your production. Specifically, the last 12 to 24 months and your reviews. They want both. They want to learn whether or not you are a consistent uh, producer. And they want to know what the client, your clients think of you afterwards. From these two pieces of information, they decide whether or not to contact you. Remember, they've got more than one agent in their sphere. So you don't need to write the Dead Sea Scrolls on your background and your interest. They're only going to, you, you know, you're, they're only going to give you eight seconds of their time. Make it count. The value of actual demonstration. What does that mean? It means how you initiate contact with them. First, impressions still matter. Now they matter more than ever. And according to recent research, most of these first impressions don't change. So you still get one shot. Your buyer and your seller pre-appointment questions are more important than they have ever been. Good, good questions demonstrate our knowledge, our expertise, and our credibility more effective than claims and statements. I'm a this and I'm a that. Once again, making it about us, not about them. Questions make it about them. Questions engage them. Good questions create an atmosphere of trust. Now, how you ask these questions matters. Develop the ability to ask hard questions in a soft way. You are seeking to develop, to develop mutual understanding. Again, it's about them, not you. So, what do I mean by this? What's the practice? How do I deliver this? For example, you meet a new prospect after your initial greetings and intros, could even be at an open house. Why not ask what their biggest concerns are about buying or selling in today's market? Why not then listen to their response and provide them with the information on how you handle that issue for your clients? In their mind, that issue is now resolved. And what that does is it frees them up to listen and to respond. You know, we're always talking about Q&A, Q&A, questions and answers. You know what we need to pay attention to? Quest Q and L, questions and listening. We're so worried about what we're going to say next, we can't listen to what people are saying. And so we either give an inadequate response or one that doesn't match, you know, their query. Learn to listen. It's, one of, it's probably the strongest um, asset you'll develop as a salesperson. Next thing is the value in personalization. This is so important, and, it, and we're so missing this. this is, we are missing this. Last year, $1.5 billion was invested in real estate technology. You're seeing it grow right in front of your eyes. And yet when people are asked about what they care about most, and the Wave Group did this back at the end of last year, the first thing they listed, communication. Second thing they listed they wanted from their agent, data. Nowhere in the list 
did technology show up? That's in our mind. It's not in theirs. Now, what is the role for technology? What they did say is they would like to see the sales process simplified and streamlined. So we could continue to work on that track. We can look for technology that helps us there. But they want us to talk to them. So make sure you personalize your email communication. It can be as simple as a signature that always says thanks or always says looking forward to hearing from you or seeing you soon. It makes a difference. I was teaching this to a broker last fall and he said, you know, Nance, that's really true. He said, I'm, do, I'm dealing in a commercial transaction right now. And the other uh, commercial agent always signs his emails, hope to hear from you soon. Even when there's no response required, that's what's always there. And I have to tell you, I liked that. I liked reading it. I responded favorably to it. Again, it's a way to personalize. You know, whatever presence technology has in our lives and in our work, it's never going to take the place of you, and it is foolish to let it. Remember how social media was going to be the begin-all and end-all? Has it been? No. How many agents, how many companies went out of business or nearly went out of business putting all their eggs in that basket? Gang, they want us. They want people. Now, you may say to me, well, Nance, when I'm working with the younger generation, the millennial, for example, all they want to do is text. Of course they do, and I get that. I like using text as well. However, if I'm in a real estate transaction with a millennial, here's what I'm going to say to them. I will, I will respect your wish to communicate with you by text. However, if you get a text message that says, I'm calling you right now, pick up the phone, that there is something I need to discuss with you. There's something I need to make sure you understand before you agree to it. And since this is the largest single financial transaction you're likely to make anytime soon, it's worth your while to pick up that phone. And you know what they say? Okay. So don't think that you're blocked. You're not. But you've got to speak up. You know what's important. They don't. The value in qualifying. Boy, I tell you, I can't stress this one enough. Qualify everyone that matters to the successful outcome of the transaction. All professionals qualify. All of us. There's no way you can do business without. And we're scared to death. We're scared if we ask these questions, people won't quote like us. They'll get mad at us. How are they going to feel when the deal's blown up because somebody didn't do their job? And what I've seen in the last couple of years, as markets have come back stronger, you know what happens. People get into real estate. A lot of people wrongly believe that it's easy money. Well, a lot of these brokers will hire anybody that, you know, fogs a mirror. And these people are getting no training, no supervision. And you may be putting your transaction, your client, in the hands of somebody that doesn't know doodly squat. So we know to qualify our clients. We know to qualify buyers. We know to qualify sellers. Are you qualifying co-broke agents? I was coaching an agent who works up here last fall. And she had a trend. This is a very experienced, very savvy agent. She had a transaction last fall with someone who sold, an agent, you know, sold her listing and come to find out she didn't know anything. She had moved over to resales from a new home sales project. The person that brought her in was head of a team. They didn't, they, they've never trained her on anything. They've never supervised her on anything. She had no idea what to do. Well, the agent was trying to help her. She finally picked up the phone, called her team leader, and said, hey, you need to step in here. And the woman said, well, I thought you knew what she was doing. She's worked in new homes. She said, new homes is not resale. Get on top of this or this deal's going to blow up. 
team members, another great example. You know, they get no, I work with teams. Very few teams get supervision and training. Most team leaders have no idea. Now, this exists largely in, in larger teams, but they have no idea what their team members are doing. No, no clue. The same goes for qualifying lenders. Are you using people that are ethical and yet get the job done? And all of your vendors. Vendors have always been important to consumers. Are they licensed and bonded? Do they have a track record of doing work right the first time? Or making it right if something, you know, happens. These are all part of qualifying, and it's what's necessary today to ensure a successful outcome. The next value, this is the simplest thing I will ever teach you, and you will love it. The value in a 30-day marketing calendar for your sellers. There is a ton of value in this. 30-day calendar, which includes all the work that you're going to be doing, including the pre-launch stage. List everything you do, and I mean everything. Phone calls, appointments, scheduling, marketing, online platforms, when, when they come online, where, follow-ups, meeting with vendors, all of it. Gang, we've always done a lot more than we got credit for. Don't let that happen. I've had agents I coach deliver marketing calendars in their presentations to their sellers. And the sellers are dumbfounded. And they'll look and they'll say, you're going to do all of this? Yes, this is a listing of everything I'll do. Now, I want you to understand, let's look at items on pre-launch. That's before your listing goes to mark, you know, is actually ready to market. If one of the vendors can't show up, or it's pouring rain, we probably won't do the photos that day or the video. We'll have to put, they don't even care. And everybody says when they go in the listing, it's posted to the refrigerator. It's out where they can see it. They love this. In writing, 30 day increments, inc include pre launch and include every single thing you do. I could tell you more and more stories about how sellers respond to this calendar in every price range. Now, somebody said, well, Nance, because what I teach people, I said, look, you want something simple. I said, you go, you try to make this too sophisticated, and they're going to think you cranked it out, and that you didn't have anything to do with it. And what you want to understand, even a running list doesn't have the same effect. I have agents literally printing out a 30-day calendar from their computer on iCal or Outlook or whatever you're using. I don't care, all right, and writing it in, what happens when. Now, some agents have said to me, Nancy, if you could see the way I write, you wouldn't ask me to do that. And I say, look, I know, but you're missing the point. The point is it's in writing, and they can see it. And so one agent that I work with who closes – over 100 deals a year, he said, well, I've, I've just got to type it. My, my writing is too bad. And I said, okay, suit yourself. So he typed it. And he says, you know, Nancy, it's, it's not having the impact that I thought it would have. And I said, well, let's do an experiment. Let's hand write it, okay? I don't care how bad your penmanship is. Hand write it, which he did. The response changed immediately. Again, this goes back to that personalization. This goes back to that hands-on. They want to know what we're doing. They're paying us a lot of money. Now, in terms of, you know, how you would do this, you know, and, and expedite really, really easily, as an office, you can come up. You can put all your collective brains together and come up with a list of all the possibilities, almost a checklist pre-launch what are all the possibilities that might be included week one week two week three week four okay and when we get to week four that better include a price reduction meeting it needs to be right there on that marketing calendar because if you haven't gotten an offer if you're not under contract in four weeks something's wrong and you need to go back and relook at the data and get a price reduction 
all of that's on the calendar. So now once you've got your, your list as an office, all you've got to do is pick and choose what you do. I mean, a lot of it's going to be the same thing. Pre-launch is really where you're going to see a difference because that you know varies on what the property needs. But it's so easy, and it's something they absolutely love. And speaking of price reductions, that's our next point of value, price reductions. Every 30 days. Now, I want you to understand something. In, in what I consider normal markets, price reductions every 30 days works. However, if you're in markets where inventory is very low and things sell and go, un go under contract very quickly, you need a price reduction in two weeks. If you let it sit for four weeks, you're going to have a stale listing on your hands. And remember, Wall Street Journal wrote an article about this a couple of years ago and said listings that stay on the market longer than 30 days, buyers term them as stale and they lose interest. They, they go back to thinking something's wrong with it or they're going to get a deal. Most of them in a lot of markets, they'll just ignore it. You know, you've sort of lost, lost them. So a price reduction every 30 days. Allow for this. Set it up at the time of the listing. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, if we haven't had an offer in two weeks or four weeks, I'll reanalyze market activity to see if I've missed something or whether there's been a change. Now, change. Two more things come into mind. A lot of agents were asking me last fall, Nance, are our markets changing? Some of them were. And, you know, what's going on? Our market's getting softer. What you want to understand is, yeah, they're all telling us that this, you know, should continue to be a great year in real estate. There's nothing on the horizon. You know, we're, we're at full employment as the numbers go. Um, we're also going to see wage growth this year, I believe, and that will really help us. But if you do sense a change, there are two things that you can track that you'll need to understand, that you'll need to explain if you start seeing them creep into your market. And one is what we call a leading indicator. A leading indicator is a change up or down that is happening in real time. It won't necessarily show up in your pricing research for the last couple of months because it's happening right now. For example, nothing's going under contract. Nobody's at open houses. Phone's not ringing. Something's going on. A great example of that is what happened in coastal markets after the heavy hurricane season we saw in early September. And so when it happened, I mean, if you were on the coastal markets, whether you were a direct, whether you sustained a direct hit or not, it affected you. What we didn't know was whether or not it was a blip on the radar screen or whether or not it was changing things. And so, as luck would have it, it was a blip on the radar screen. September was slow. October came roaring back. People just didn't want to go down there and get caught in a storm. But they were still very willing to buy. But how you would explain that in your pricing analysis is, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I want you to understand that these, these numbers are reflected in the activity of the last two months. What I'm seeing this month is a change. It's what we call a leading indicator. It is happening in real time. And I have no way of knowing at this point whether or not this is a change that's going to stay with us or one that's going to move out quickly because it was just related to what was happening right now. Another thing you want to watch is consumer confidence. Cons it's so funny that we're measuring this again. Uh, consumer confidence has always had a, uh, a big impact on whether or not people buy or sell real estate. And most of your um, chambers of commerce are tracking that for you. So take a look at it. It's very strong. I think it's, it's stronger since, I think it's either 2000 or 1999. It's, it has come roaring back. 
and and what the, and that always bodes well for us because consumer confidence measures people's belief their belief at the fact that they'll have a job that they'll you know earn a living wage that they'll be able to take care of their family that's what you want to understand about that and so as long as that measure is still up there you should be good to go but those are the things you can watch if you have concerns about that the next thing in terms of value are actually two things and that's the value of client guarantees guarantees are just that seller guarantees buyer guarantees in writing signed and dated part of the agreements and you have to make sure that your guarantees list things that the new consumer cares about some of the things we've talked about today in the, in our value proposition and you don't want to call it a promise because if you research the word promise people don't have a lot of faith in the word promise they believe promises can be broken however guarantee implies consequence and the consequence is if you don't do what's on your list of guarantees to do the seller or the buyer has the right to fire you on the spot no questions asked I know that there are some guarantees in place out there they exist among franchises and whatever gang it's the right idea but they're not strong enough they are not there's no meat on those bones they're kind of silly in, in, in my opinion we've got to develop um, guarantees that actually mean something and we also have to understand the penalty of not delivering on these guarantees and we've got to be able to accept that we can get fired if we don't do what we say we're going to do so again a set of buyer guarantees a set of seller guarantees now go beyond that there are some great marketing opportunities when you develop guarantees you can put them in your email signature you can put them in your profiles you can send it out to your spheres of influence you can do target marketing with these guarantees and you can do it more than once a year it's part of branding and no no brand was ever successfully launched by hearing about it one time coke did not become the real thing because they only said it once they said it year after year after year and I'm gonna do some webinars on buyer and seller guarantees and I'll give you a, a sample of both so you'll have that if you need help with it but understand there's no downside of this other than you not delivering what you've promised and then there should be a downside we should be held accountable we should be under promising and over delivering but in fact the reverse is too often true what's the next piece of value this one may surprise you the value of self-care to be considered truly successful professionals never take their success for granted in order for you to be able to do all of these things we've talked about today to deliver them consistently to work at the top of your game for your clients self-care is critically important your health regular exercise healthy food it's really really important people that are top producers they would no more give up their exercise program than the man in the moon it's their sanity and they know that that's important in order to do the job at the level they do they also eat well thank God there's more and more attention to healthy eating in this country and avoiding you know all the crap food we get at the drive through window but it takes planning it takes work to eat healthy it is a transition but it matters one of the things you'll find I did as I transitioned into into healthy food several years back um is that if I tried to cheat 
and you know eat junk for a while oh my body didn't like it at all my body was going nah you're not giving me that junk anymore i know about the good stuff and so understand that may happen as well your relationships do the work relationships are work okay but they're worth it what you have in your life the people in your life what you give to your family those things matter they matter more than any of this other stuff that we do make them a priority if you don't there will be a price to pay and the reward on the other hand is one it's great financial build wealth don't just make money build wealth too many people especially in sales make a lot of money and yet at the first sign of a downturn or something they they're in trouble you know what i said at the at, uh, at the end of last year when we were talking about planning for this year people don't plan to fail they fail to plan we don't we don't think that we're not going to have the money we need when we need it we think that we will we don't think that we might have a health issue and that might cut into our income we somehow because you know think that it's all going to work out planning ensures that do something creative it feeds your soul it also enhances your brain activity i took a drawing class last summer believe me i cannot draw a straight line crooked you got to trust me on this i started taking that class the most painful thing i've done in years let me tell you because all these other people in there look like leonardo da vinci to me and i did improve comparatively speaking but one of the things that happened was that you know we all dream while we're sleeping well i haven't remembered a dream in years i couldn't tell you when the last dream was that i remembered i started remembering my dreams it was in, so interesting i started my eye was finer tuned i looked at things differently to create something it doesn't matter what it is you don't have to be fantastic at it you just enjoy it that's what matters and the last thing i would say to you is it goes by fast make it count i cannot believe i have been doing this work with all of you for 21 years but i have and it's been a journey that i have enjoyed 98% of the time so think about what we've talked about today i will delve into some of them more in detail when we go through future webinars so if you need extra help you'll have them but understand the value proposition for today's consumer really is very straightforward and very simple it's it's not that difficult to do it the fact is is that we're not doing it so think this way value in understanding the new consumer value in a relevant and consistent approach to your sphere value in your own online profile being updated and having production and reviews value by how you initiate contact with the questions that you ask value in personalization value in qualifying everyone that matters to that transaction value in a 30-day marketing calendar value in price reductions at a minimum every 30 days value in client guarantees for buyer and seller and value in taking care of yourself it's been a pleasure thanks so much for joining me take good care talk to you again soon